I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. We have a great show for you tonight. And if you're tired of us starting out by talking about dreary subjects like drug use in Portland, hey, fear not. Tonight, we're going out to the beautiful Columbia Gorge, where a fascinating change is underway. It involves irrigation and history and the future. And it's definitely our big story tonight. Did you know there are irrigation systems in Hood River that date back to the 1800s? Seriously, and it's not just something sitting in a museum somewhere. These things are working right now. Well, working is maybe a generous term. Some are so dilapidated that only 30% of the water they carry actually makes it all the way to the farm. Most of it leaks out or evaporates, and that is a problem. So there's a change underway. An expensive one, though. Our environmental reporter, Kale Williams, went to check it out. Yeah, at least a century. It's been rolling water through here. It definitely needs updating. So, I mean, it's pretty. That's Steve cool. Pappas isn't sure when this irrigation canal was built. Yeah. But he knows it wasn't any time recently. I don't know the exact day, but it's from the early 1800s. Pappas is the manager of the East Fork Irrigation District in Hood River County. The district provides water to more than 10,000 acres of farmland, dotted with orchards growing apples, pears, and cherries. But Pappas is facing a problem endemic across the West, where irrigation systems played a key role in how this part of the country was settled. They were built by hand and horse, or they were built by you know, that first generation that really came out West. And so these systems have worked very well for a long time. They're, That's Julie O'Shea. Executive Director of the Farmers Conservation Alliance. And the systems themselves are just not as efficient in meeting the dynamic needs of modern water delivery. We see systems that are losing 30 to 70 percent of the water being drawn, not making it out to the farm. The East Fork District runs what's called a traveling system. That means Pappas has to keep a certain amount of water running through the canals at all times, just in case a farmer needs to use it. He likened it to leaving your sink on all day, just in case you want a glass of water. And given that most of the district's canals are open, that can make for a lot of waste. Whatever they're not using, then is going to kick into an overflow, and this overflow just kicks into a drainage ditch down here. As temperatures have climbed over the last few decades, Pappas has seen the changes trickle down from the glaciers on the slopes of Mount Hood, where most of his water comes from, to his district downriver. You know, the climate changes, the glaciers are smaller and smaller. We have Less than a dozen. 20 years ago, there was over two dozen. So, And the stakes, they couldn't be higher. Economically, if we don't have this water and we don't modernize, eventually these farms dwindle away and become condos. That's the key word for a lot of irrigation districts across the West. Modernization. And then this is where we divert water. Though. That means converting open canals to buried pipelines and swapping hand cranks that let water into the system for automatic head gates that can be controlled remotely. We're just starting our modernization plan here, so we're about 25 years behind. But we're on an aggressive approach. He said they'll have most of the canals piped within seven years, but at a price tag of roughly $40 million. And that's not including the main canal. They're saying that's about $64 million. So... So $100 million. Yeah, $100 million. Just a cool $100 million. You can donate to our website. <laughs> And that's where Pappas has looked to outside groups for help. I think the Farmers the Conservation Alliance has been a key partner. We're working with individual irrigation communities to help them plan out what their vision is for modernization, to find partners to implement that, and then to find the funding to be able to actually implement on those projects. O'Shea said there is funding out there. There are state and federal matching grants available, but the application process is very complex and the competition can be fierce. Without them, helping us, you know, we, we would be lost. But the benefits of upgrading a water system, they're hard to dispute. We know we want farms and food grown in our state. We know we want water and streams. We know we want energy resiliency. These pieces aren't in competition with each other. When you modernize an irrigation system, you really get this win-win-win benefit. And you don't have to look far to see those benefits in practice. So that most of our growers are irrigating with about half of the amount of water that they did 30 years ago. Les Perkins, yeah, so they, who manages the Farmers Irrigation District in Lower Hood River Valley, said it wasn't that long ago that his system looked a lot like the one in East Fork. We had 70 miles of open canal running through really steep slopes. 
uh, wooded slopes. They continually failed. So we started putting pipe in the ground and that did a couple things for us. Uh, it made it easier to get the water down where we used it and then it conserved a whole bunch of water. We lost more than half of the water uh, from the point that we diverted it to the point we got it to the farms. With a pipe system, gravity pressurizes the water. And that means farmers don't need to pump it out of a canal. This is powerhouse number two. But more importantly, it opens up the opportunity to turn that pressurized water into electricity. So all the water that comes through and is going back into the river comes through here? Comes through here, passes the farms on the way, we deliver water to farms. Uh, what's not used for agriculture ends up coming through the powerhouse. Uh, it's a working model, exact working model of the turbine. That we water have. is sprayed onto a giant rudder, spinning a shaft connected to a turbine, which creates power that is then fed into the grid. So we use this unit for demonstrations for a lot of school groups that come through and want to understand more about how, how you produce electricity. Yeah, and reporters too. And reporters, yeah, absolutely. The Farmers District has two of these powerhouses, capable of producing up to 4.4 megawatts of power, enough to power more than 4,000 homes. But it's been the best investment we could have made. And the money they made selling that power made more upgrades to the rest of the system possible. So we started putting pipe in the ground. That actually uh, gave us more water available. Uh, it made more money through the powerhouses. It gave better returns for our growers. And that feedback loop just kept going for, for 30 years. Now, with a fully piped system, Perkins has seen his customers' water needs shrink dramatically. But for Pappas, and the water savings the are just half the equation. We need a happy balance. You know, They need water to produce the food and their crops. But we also, in turn, need to make sure we're keeping a healthy ecosystem with the fish and the habitat and by modernizing our system, closing it off, closing up canals, it all works in harmony together. After all, every drop of water that's wasted, you never get back. Kale joins me now. Super interesting story. And one of the questions is, how are they ever going to pay for all that? Well, you know, there are a bunch of different streams of revenue that they can tap into. There's state programs, there's federal programs, but all of those are matching grants. And so they have to come up with some money on their own. I mean, Steve Pappas was kind of joking when he said that they have a donate button on their website, but they do have a donate <laughs> button on their website. So, wow. you know, they have to cobble all this stuff together, but it happens over time. And so they don't have to come up with all of it at once. Okay. And you were saying that one example is they did come up with it like 30 years, right? Yeah, I mean, at the Farmers Irrigation District, they were able to come up with enough money to get some water in pipes. Then they were able to get their powerhouse in there, which generates revenue. They were able to use that revenue to then put more pipes in, and it became kind of a system that feeds itself. Yeah, I think a lot of us don't think about irrigation canals and that whole system until we maybe drive by one. But it makes me wonder how much of this is going on around the state. So I asked them that, and Oregon has 73 irrigation districts all over the place. Wow. Mm -hmm. And this, this group, the Farmers Conservation Alliance, they're working with 35 of them to help modernize their systems. So you get a sense that, you know, this is happening all over the place, but each one is different. They're all different sizes and they all exist in different areas that have different water needs. Like you imagine the folks in Hood River have a lot different water needs than the folks in Morrow County or down in Klamath. Yeah, wow, interesting stuff. All right, thanks, Kale. Appreciate you bringing that forward. Moving on, this article featured in the current edition of Willamette Week is certainly worth your time. We're finally getting a look at the itinerary for the much anticipated, slightly controversial Portugal trip that several local leaders will be attending to see how drug decriminalization is going there. Oregon's Measure 110 was modeled after Portugal's decriminalization law. The group includes Multnomah County Chair Jessica Vega Peterson, three Democratic state lawmakers and one Republican state rep. Multnomah County District Attorney Mike Schmidt was originally going to go, but the morning after our last story on the trip, his office called to say, okay, they emailed, and they said, you know what, he's just too busy, he's not going to go. Instead, a staffer is going to go in his place. Also on the list is the president of the Portland Police Association, Aaron Schmautz. We'll hear from him in a little bit. The trip is funded by the Health Justice Recovery Alliance. That's a group which wants Measure 110 left alone amid this growing effort to drastically change it and recriminalize possession of hard drugs. The drama surrounding this fact-finding trip is no secret. Many wonder why a trip across the globe is necessary, especially considering the issues we're facing right here and now here in Oregon. The trip was even used as a barb by Commissioner Sharon Myron against Chair Vega Peterson during a heated discussion over homelessness funding last week. I'm curious, just in terms of even visiting some of these um, 
places that the county is involved in, if the chair has personally visited the BHRC over the past couple of months, it is closer than Portugal, I will say. Oh, yeah. So let's hope the trip's all about business, right? Well, they'll arrive in Lisbon, Portugal on Sunday, October 29th, and their scheduled events begin that Monday. They'll meet with the man behind Portugal's drug decriminalization program that morning. It's a man that we've had on the show twice now, crossing the Atlantic via the Internet instead of via airplane in our case. That afternoon, they'll visit treatment and harm reduction sites before a group dinner to talk about what they heard and what they saw that day. Seems like a pretty productive day one. And then Tuesday, Halloween here at home, the group will meet with law enforcement and visit more treatment and harm reduction facilities. OK, so far so good. Day three, though, is a holiday in Portugal, which apparently makes it a day off for our tour group. Nothing formal is planned. But the itinerary says this. Explore St. George Castle Viewpoint, Commerce Square, Time Out Market and other attractions. I mean, maybe. But here's another idea. Maybe they should use the day to wander around the city to see what the drug use situation really looks like for themselves. Or maybe go three hours north to Porto. That's another Portugal city where the problem is especially bad, or at least it was bad over the summer. Get away from being led around by your tour guides and what they want you to see. The final day is in Portugal on Thursday. They're planning to visit with the Portuguese lawmakers before a group discussion, debrief and dinner. The group heads back home on Friday, November 3rd. I had a chance to talk with the head of Portland's police union about why he's going on this trip. Aaron Schmout said the union will pay for his trip and he wants a seat at the table for these discussions. I've had a million conversations with people about Portugal as an example. Um, I think it's really hard to compare countries, uh, cultures, communities, uh, policies and historical realities um, but if if a conversation is going to happen, if that trip's going to happen, I want to make sure that there is law enforcement present to make sure that if there's questions that need to be asked, answered, policies that might develop, that we're there to, to help navigate that. All right. State Senator Kate Lieber, a Democrat, said she is also going and will pay for the trip herself. She's a co-chair of a new committee put together by state lawmakers to try and fix Oregon's drug problems. She said if Oregon's Measure 110 is modeled after Portugal, she wants to go see it for herself. One of the things that is missing that I'm really curious about finding out is how do they have this accountability within their public health side of the system, sort of that demand side of the system? How do we lessen the demand side and still have accountability? Um, my understanding is that they actually have achieved that. Uh, well, yeah, not so much, actually. When Portugal first launched its decriminalization program back in 2001, in fact, they were able to get addicts into treatment as soon as they asked for it. The country has socialized medicine, and so there was no waiting for help back then. But after a strong start, that has now changed. The Washington Post reports that there are now long waits for help, that drug users openly use on the streets, and police are losing motivation to write them tickets because nothing happens. It did before, but not now. Here's the head of Portugal's drug system talking about that very thing at Georgetown University's law school over the summer. It is true that we are having some difficulties nowadays uh, in uh, supplying treat uh, timely uh, uh, treatment without uh, uh, waiting lists, for instance. Uh, we have a visibility of disorganized uh, users on the streets in Lisbon and in the Porto, mostly in the, the big cities. Uh, and we uh, are concerned about it. Dr. Gual there is one of the people the Oregon folks are going to meet with. Another Oregon lawmaker taking the trip is Rob Nose. Unlike the other two we've heard from here, he will accept the $2,500 stipend from the group organizing the trip, the same group which promoted the passage of Measure 110. For the folks that are watching this, you know, I'm not, I'm not hurting by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a middle-class person, okay? But um, I don't have a lot of money at my disposal that I can literally just afford a pretty expensive plane ticket and a hotel stay and food and meals. And, you know, so yes, I am taking the stipend to help offset the cost. It won't cover all of my costs, but it'll certainly help. Meanwhile, I think, you know, not 
taking this kind of field trip at taxpayer expense. The state of Oregon uh, is not contributing to the cost. And neither are my donors. Um, campaign donations, I think, are really for campaigns and not for field trips. All right, fair enough. And I do appreciate Rep. Nose being candid about that. But my next question is, well, won't that influence how you approach this trip and ultimately how you feel about decriminalizing drugs? We're dealing with government officials, law enforcement types, we're also talking with uh, mental health and healthcare providers. And, you know, like, do I think that they're finding people that are deep critics of this in the Portuguese uh, political ecosystem to sort of come talk to us? No, probably not. Um, but I think that we'll hear about that. And I've definitely, you know, I have constituents that are a little bit skeptical of ballot measure 110, and I've encouraged them to send their ideas and their questions along to me. And so, I intend to engage my brain and try to be a critical thinker as much as I can. All right, that sounds good. And I can just hear some of you saying, I've got a question by golly, or I've got a comment. Well, good, here's your chance. You can email uh, Representative No, send him your questions or comments. The email is rep.robnose at oregonlegislature.gov. Tell him the story sent you. Coming up next on the story, you may have heard about the mass overdose at a Portland park this week, eight young adults overdosing on what's suspected to be fentanyl. So what can be done to curb the crisis? The ideas from one city commissioner and his remarks that were not included in earlier newscasts when the story returns. Now, you may have seen a story in our earlier newscast, but come on, put down that remote, stay with us, because this is different. This week, eight young people overdosed, likely on fentanyl, in a Portland park near the corner of Northwest Cooch and 8th. It's awful. It's the highest number of overdoses in one incident the Portland Fire says it has ever responded to. And the area where it happened? It's not a resource des desert for addicts. The Central City Concern is nearby. The new Behavioral Health Resource Center is a block away but they don't offer immediate addiction help. They refer people to detox centers, which, as we've reported, have lengthy wait lists. So, what can be done? 
Well, last week, Multnomah County Commissioners voted to spend nearly $7 million on a stabilization center. That's for people experiencing mental health or drug-induced crisis. They also chipped in $150,000 to start planning for a Stoberring Center, despite calls from the community and some commissioners to focus on funding and opening that Stoberring Center first. Portland City Council member Renee Gonzalez did not have a say in how that money was spent, but our Blair Best sat down with him today to talk about the things he does think need to be done to curb the fentanyl crisis. Whether the 300 uh, overdoses uh, you reported at Station 1, we hear it across our city, particularly clustered in certain areas uh, on the east side in downtown and Old Town. But uh, this is a new normal for us, unfortunately, and we've got to do everything in our power to reverse that trend. One, statewide, we've got to get the addiction services online that everyone was promised. Two, we've got to make this place a lot less hospitable to outdoor drug consumption. City Council approved an outdoor drug ban. Now we need help from the state legislature. I think three, we've got to uh, really look at how we're prosecuting drug dealers. And four, I think we need to really think about a county-level health emergency. Commissioner Myron at the county raised that prospect a couple of weeks ago and kind of batting around what resources could we could bring to bear and I think that might lead to more aggressive approach to uh, potentially confiscating drugs uh, changing our pre-release policies for drug dealers across the board evaluating every policy trade-off that can allow for a more rigorous response to the drug trade and use on our streets. And in case you missed it a few weeks ago, city leaders did pass a ban on outdoor drug use. It basically is expanding the city law that makes it illegal to drink liquor in public and to now include using drugs. Violators could be fined as much as $500 or get six months in jail or both. But right now, it's not enforceable. And that's because of a statewide law from the 70s that did not include a carve out for enforcing drug use bans because possession of drugs was illegal back then. But Measure 110 came along and that all changed, but the law did not. So that's what Gonzalez means when he says they need help from the legislature. Now, during the short session next year, that part of the old law needs amending. And if that happens, then Portland can enforce its outdoor drug ban. Whether it's actually enforced or prosecuted for that matter is a discussion for months down the road. But we'd love to hear what you think should be done about the fentanyl crisis on our streets. Send us your thoughts, will you? You can email us. The address is the story at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail 503-226-5090. Stay with us. We're back right after this.
As newspapers consolidate, go digital only, or simply close their doors, a lot of people are left without crucial local news coverage, and that's bad, especially those in rural areas who may not get at great internet access. But in Wasco County, a couple is trying to buck the trend by launching a new local newspaper. It's only monthly right now, mostly due to its small staff led by a retired husband-wife team who are not really retired any longer. Joe Ranieri has our story. The daily paper might be something that's disappearing across the country, but in Wasco County, it's starting up again. There's lots of ranchers, there's lots of people who, like the old school, having a newspaper in their hand. Colleen Strom is the publisher and editor of the South Wasco Times, and her husband, Doug Lowell, who's a retired Portland State advertising professor, is the advertising manager and photographer. Some of it will be in depth, for instance, reporting on... Um, meetings of the city councils or of planning commissions and such where we need to have a lot of detail for people. The monthly paper just released its first edition this month. It's the only source of news for many in this part of the state that includes small towns like Maupin, Dufer, and Pine Grove. Places that are known for its rolling hills and outdoor recreation like camping and fishing. Strom says their biggest decision behind launching the paper was because residents don't have many options. I thought it was really important to have a news source that would reach everybody, and not everybody here does internet. And how they've been getting their local news hasn't always been the most accurate. Most of the news here was transmitted to people at the post office or at the gas station, or, you know, there would be a meeting and people would talk about it the next day and they got it all wrong. Together, they are hoping to change that. It's not news that goes away. It's not news that, that expires that we're, we're focused on. We're focused on some of the bigger issues. As they help connect these rural communities together. Yeah. I think we're optimistic. We have no idea how this is going to go. Joe Ranieri, KGW News. Well, hopefully it goes for a long, long time. Congratulations. The first run of the paper was a success. It sold out in a few different locations where they distribute. Let's hope that all continues. Strom and her husband do most of the work, but they do have a few others who help out with articles here and there. Hey, that's the end of our show. Thanks so much for watching. And remember the story, our collective story, that never ends. The good stuff is coming up next. I'll see you back here tomorrow.